Welcome to Relationship University. Wherever you are joining us from, I want to say, man, I am so grateful that you have taken the time to join us, whether it's your first time today or whether you are a regular. Relationship University is such a blessing because we talk about relationship, helping others you know, to understand all the different aspects of relationship. We've got a variety of topics and a variety of speakers. Uh, we deal with marriage, of course, and singleness and sexuality and parenting and you know just all things <laughs> relationship. And what an important topic in our culture today, I believe even more than ever. So again, thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, we encourage you to check out our Relationship University archives, which you can find at awmi.net forward slash relationships. There's just a wealth of information and revelation that will really be a blessing to you. And then also, if you're not aware, we have Relationship University curriculum. It was recorded, uh, and this is just an amazing resource. And if you have not yet discovered that, it's about 56 hours of curriculum from a variety of teachers. And so again, you can go to awmi.net or you can call 719-635-1111 to order that product. There is a cost for that product, but I'm telling you, it is worth the investment. Uh, again, a variety of topics and a variety of teachers, all relating to relationship and relationship issues. So I know it's gonna be a tremendous blessing for you. So today, we have about 45 minutes of teaching, and if you desire prayer or have questions, Maybe uh, something comes up in your heart during the teaching today, or you just really would love to have somebody pray with you about something that you're going through with your family or in your life right now. And uh, so don't do this alone. Man, I'm telling you, we, we are so blessed to have our call center open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And someone is already there waiting to take your call that would love to be able to minister to you and agree with you. And I believe that uh, as we join together as the body of Christ, we're gonna see more and more breakthrough in our lives, in the areas that are vital to us in the season that we're in. Things change over the course of our lifetime. And many times it's just great to have somebody to be able to agree with us and pray that prayer of agreement. So again, you can reach us by calling 719-635-1111. And like I said, no matter what time zone you're in, there's gonna be somebody who is gonna be waiting to take your call because we are open now seven days a week, 24 hours a day thanks to our partners. What a blessing. So thank you so much. And my name is Daniel Amstutz, and I have the privilege of being your teacher today. Uh, I am the director of the healing ministry here at Karis Bible College, and I am excited to be able to bring this teaching. I want to talk to you today as I was praying about what to share. I really felt like the Lord said to share on developing a culture of honor in your home. And uh, man, if there's a, any place where it needs to start, it's in our homes. And so today I wanna to talk to you about developing a culture of honor. What do you think of when you think of the word honor? You know, what, what do you personally think of? Uh, when we're addressing a judge, for instance, we say your honor, right? And uh, when a student excels academically, we say, you know, typically they graduated with honors, right? And so uh, you probably heard somebody say, I'm defending her honor or I'm defending their honor. And so we can learn what honor is by looking at what it isn't, okay? It's used in many different ways, but we're gonna look at the word of God because that is our one textbook at Karis Bible College that all of us have in common. And thank God for the power of his word that has the power to just transform us, uh, not just inform us. And it does that, but the word of God is not like any other book in the universe. It is alive and it's powerful and it has the ability to be able to transform. So we're gonna look at the Word of God today as we always do, but in the Word of God, dishonor, okay? Not honor, but dishonor is used of someone that has little worth uh, or weight or value. 
So when the Greeks thought of a word picture to describe this, it's just a really interesting uh, thing because what they thought of was like mist or steam. So in other words, something that would come from uh, maybe a kettle on a stove where all you see that's coming out is just vapor. It's just steam. It had really no substance to it. It was just, you know, without weight. And this is how the Greeks, the image, the picture that the Greek language would paint on someone who was operating in dishonor. There was very little value. I don't know if you're familiar with an author, he's quite well known, but Gary Smalley and uh, another author, a PhD, John uh, Trent, wrote a book years ago called The Gift of Honor. And I really like the definition of the word honor that they've given, which they got from the word. But they said, honor is a decision to make or to place high value or worth and importance on another person by viewing that person as a priceless gift and granting that person a position in our lives worthy of great respect. And love involves putting that decision into action. So we could say that honor comes from love. And of course, the love of God is the basis for everything in our lives. The love of God is how our faith works. The love of God, uh, meaning knowing how loved we are by God, becomes the thing that makes everything else flow and work together. And so without that revelation of knowing how loved we are, uh, we're going to struggle in our lives trying to do something or achieve something that God has already done for us in Christ. Man, I'm so grateful for the love of God and that the love of God is greater than any other power in the universe. So then they go on to say in this book that like genuine love is a gift to give others, honor is also a gift we give to someone. It involves the decision uh, we make before we put love into action that a person has high value. So it's really our perspective. It's our attitude towards someone. Are we giving them high value or do we see them as somebody with very little value? This is what they said about giving our children the gift of honor. And I think this is so key because if we're gonna establish a culture of honor in our homes, then we as parents need to give our children the gift of honor. So here's some ways that we do that, okay? We do this by first extending it to our own parents. As parents ourselves, it's important for us to honor our own parents and helping uh, our children find value in troubled times is another way that we teach our children value. Not just when everything is going great, but when things are not going great, when there's testing, when there's storms going on in our lives and in our families, uh, you know, are we helping our kids to find value in their relationship with the Lord, even in these troubled times? Man, so important. Another way is recognizing our own parenting strengths and our own parenting styles. And so this will help our children receive the gift of honor. We've got to be clear in how we do what we do as parents. And if we're, you know, saying one thing but living another way, it's going to breed confusion in the hearts and lives of our children. And uh, it will do the opposite of establishing a culture of honor, right? So also providing a healthy balance in our homes of belonging and separateness and developing a healthy independence. It's really important for our kids to know that they belong, but we don't want to smother them, right? We don't want to uh, take this belonging sense over into the later teenage years to where we're, you know, uh, you know, when, when kids are young, you know, moms are often criticized as being the helicopter mom. Well, I tell you what, when kids are young, moms need to be the helicopter mom. But things change throughout life. I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. But, you know, when, when you're still trying to be the helicopter mom, when our kids are teenagers, there's a problem, 
right? But when they're two years old, three years old, man, that mom is engaged in everything that that child is doing and there to, you know, not just the mom, the dad as well, but especially the mom. And so to f providing this healthy balance in our home uh, is going to help give a sense of honor, a gift of honor to our children. They're going to start to feel safe, but they're also going to be willing to take risks uh, that are going to be good risks. You know, in other words, uh, establishing their independence. We see this in young boys as they become young men. You know, we don't want those young boys to be so protected, so, you know, afraid of hurting themselves or making a mistake that, that they uh, start developing a culture of fear instead of this independence that begins to happen, especially in the adolescent years. So another thing is establishing loving boundaries. This really kind of goes along with what I just said, but establishing loving boundaries, protection, loving limits, you know, uh, which help to produce confidence, value, and self-worth. All these things are things that need to be learned in the home. And establishing this kind of environment in the home is going to help to develop a culture of honor in the lives of our children, even from the time that they're small and they're young, growing into their adulthood. Um, also, building positive loyalties. So, in other words, children repeat patterns seen in parents. So when they see their parents developing loyalties among friends and, and business associates and ministry uh, situations, you know, there's a loyalty that they, they see in the lives of their parents. And as they see that, again, it develops a culture of honor to where kids learn that relationship is really valuable to my mom and dad. I can see that by how they're developing these loyalties with good friends and, and have good friends, right? Not just somebody that's a casual relationship that you might say hi to in the grocery store or whatever, but somebody who really uh, has a, a loyalty in your heart and in the heart of your family. And when children see that, it helps to develop a culture of honor in their lives to where they put a priority on relationship even from their young years growing into their adulthood. So uh, lastly, uh, in this section, offering honor to God. And of course, this is almost uh, to be, you know, not even mentioned, but I need to mention it because again, this is so vital that really it probably should be number one on the list here rather than number seven. But um, you know, offering honor to God is so important for our kids to see us doing as parents. If we talk about, you know, loving God and honoring God, but our kids never see it in our own walk with God. Maybe it's just something that happens when you go to a public uh, church service on a weekend, but during the week, they, they don't see anything that's honoring God. Well, that's going to become problematic, isn't it? To where the child eventually is going to rebel because they're seeing the inconsistency or the double-mindedness of somebody who's saying one thing but doing another. So again, offering honor to God in the home to where we can uh, pray together, we can value the word of God together. When something arises within the family dynamic, we deal with it according to the word of God and not just the traditions of men. And all of these things offer honor to God, but it's also developing a culture of honor within the lives of our kids. Man, I love that when you see uh, the children who have been raised in this kind of atmosphere, the difference is obvious that in their life and how they're living their lives, even as kids, it becomes a pronouncement in our culture as to the righteousness of God in Christ that's already working within them, even as young children. So people who grow up feeling worthless and unlovable are people who were dishonored in their own home. And this is what happens when you're in your own home and there's dishonor happening, especially towards the children. 
And unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of things happening in our culture today that are dishonoring children, whether it's sex trafficking or child abuse or whatever it happens to be. Those are kind of extreme examples. But a lot of times there's one culture in the home that's completely different, not good different, than what's happening when the kids are in public. They're supposed to be acting one way when they go to church, but when they're at home, it's a whole nother thing. That is not good. That culture of dishonor is actually going to produce a sense of worthlessness and a sense of uh, being unlovable uh, towards those children. So uh, often these kind of kids have grown up in environments where unloving acts have surrounded them like a vapor. And in relationships where we dishonor people, we treat them as if they have little weight or importance or value to us. And the lower the value we attach to the person, the easier we can justify, quote unquote, dishonoring them by yelling at them or uh, physical abuse or treating them with disrespect. You know, we often see this in our culture and uh, man, this is, this is absolutely uh, not the way that God wants us to be living. And of course, thank the Lord that we have the word of God to instruct us as to how to develop a culture of honor in our homes to where we don't have to be conformed to the ways of the world and treating our kids and our family and those, quote, closest to us with dishonor and disrespect, okay? So as parents, the first thing we need to do is to train our children how to honor us and how to honor us as parents is to honor them. When we as parents set the example, we set the tone and we're honoring our children. You know, it's amazing to me how a husband and a wife will talk about getting pregnant and their desire to have children and how great it's gonna be until the child comes. And then when the child comes, they develop this culture of dishonor and disrespect toward their own children. Why, why did you even have kids in the first place, right? So you see this uh, you know, double-mindedness sometimes in, in out of the brokenness, obviously, of where that parent is living. And uh, man, God wants us to, to you know, model this to our kids. If we're going to teach our kids honor, then it begins with us as parents to where we honor our children. We value who they are. And Psalm 127 is a familiar scripture here, verse three, which says that our children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. <laughs> and sometimes when our kids are misbehaving, we need to remind ourselves of this, right? Of course, there's a discipline process in, in training our children in the way they are to go. But man, we just need to keep in mind that our children are a gift from the Lord. Amen. They are priceless treasures. And we need to see that our children are just that. And then in Matthew chapter 6, another uh, you know, familiar passage here in verse 21, it says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this, of course, is speaking uh, literally of money in this context, in this verse. But I believe the principle applies here. You know, where your treasure is, your heart will be. Well, when you're treasuring your kids, when you see them as valuable, you see them as priceless, you see them as treasure, then you know what? your heart's gonna be involved in the raising of those kids. You're gonna to wanna to invest and do what the Word of God says instead of being conformed to the ways of the world. So do you remember when the lawyer was asking Jesus in the Gospels, we find this story, which was the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answered by saying, uh, Matthew chapter 22 now, we're gonna to go to and look at verse 36 through 40. Here's what he said. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So in other words, all that is within you, right? You're, you'll, you're gonna love the Lord your God. This is our response to God loving us. And then he said, this is the first and great commandment. 
And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Okay? So everything is connected to this principle of relationship. We know God loves us. So what are we going to do? We're going to respond. We're going to respond by loving the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. And then what are we going to do as a result? We're going to love our neighbor as ourself. So, you know, you can see that when things are lined up properly, according to the word of God, it's like a river that just flows, you know? Uh, it, it's not something that gets dammed up or something that just barely trickles out. No, there's a life force that is going to make a huge difference. And again, it starts in the home. It doesn't start with ministry out, you know, on a mission field somewhere or on a platform at a church service, right? All of this is to be lived out in that microcosm of the home and, and where we see it lived from the inside out into the macro of the world system. So if you love somebody with all that is within you, you're going to honor them right? This is what Jesus was saying. It's a matter of the heart and it's all about relationship. So I have seven relationships that I want to talk to you about today. And uh, I believe these relationships will help train the heart of your child to honor. So number one I want to talk about is the honor of your father and your mother. And this is so vital. In Exodus chapter 20, Verses 12, or verse 12, it says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So, yes, this was under the law, but I want you to notice that one of the things that is attached to honoring the, your father and your mother is long life. And I say, yes, this is under the law because we find it here in Exodus 20. But we're going to find out that this is also confirmed in the new covenant. In fact, let's go to that. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 says this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What's the promise? That it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. You know, it's interesting, especially being the director of healing ministry here at Karis Bible College, you know, a lot of people want to uh, live a life of, of uh, no sickness, no disease, a life that's healthy, okay? Well, that's a great thing. But notice here, something so simple that we often overlook. It says, when we honor our parents, when we obey our parents in the Lord as children, and then we honor our father and our mother, there's a commandment with promise that's attached to that honor. This is how important honor is. And what is the promise? That it may be well with you. Well, I wonder how many of us have opened ourselves up to sickness and disease by how we have not honored our father and our mother, how we have not been obedient to their direction in our lives. And you know what, we often see this in the lives of very famous uh, rock and roll, uh, you know, rap artists, people who are, you know, typically as we would think of them, maybe living on the edge, they're using drugs, they're on cocaine, they're, they're sleeping around with anybody and everybody. You know, and what happens? We often see these people who are dying in their 20s. They're dying in their 30s. You know, their, their life is such a mess by the time they've lived this lifestyle for a number of years. Well, I keep wondering, you know, this is somebody's child. You know, whoever that person is that's so famous, this is still somebody's child. And at what point did that child rebel against maybe even the instruction of their mom and dad? I'm thinking of somebody like Katy Perry right now, who is, you know, the child of a ministry family. And, uh, you know, there's a whole story that goes with that. And she's one of many, many examples in our culture today where someone was raised in a Christian home, but they've decided that they know better. And so they've made their own decisions with their own lifestyle, their own way of living. Well, you know what? That is not a good decision. 
The Bible says that we need to be honoring our father and our mother that it may be well with us and that we may live a long time on the earth. This is what God wants for every one of us. He wants us to be well more than we even want to be well. Amen? So God wants us to prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers, the Word of God tells us. And this passage here in Ephesians just simply confirms that. So another scripture here is out of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20, where it says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. So again, you know, when kids are growing up, they're not going to obey their parents in everything. There's going to be that tug of war, that give and take. They're going to learn by living life and doing what needs to be done. But they're not going to do it perfectly. And this is what parents are for, is to help guide and direct and make these moments of failure in the child's life a teachable moment where they realize, you know what, God's way really is better. I just chose my own way and it did not go well for me. <laughs> so it's, it's just much, much better to go with what God said. But many times we rebel, we disobey, we act out in our flesh, and we have to discover that God's word is really better. So parents should help teach their children how to obey. And to obey is to honor. Jesus even said, if you love me, obey my word. This is how we, are, uh, how we can know that we are really walking in the love of God is how we are obeying the word of God. When children learn to respect their parents' authority, their obedience comes naturally as a result. And it's best, doesn't mean it's, you know, it has to be, but it's best if it happens under six years of age. Now, if you're in a situation where you're like, man, well, I've missed that window already. Listen, God is absolutely able to redeem and restore anything. I've seen the most amazing situations that God has gotten involved in and brought restoration and healing and recovery to. But if you have the option, if you have the choice, it's much better to teach your children when they're uh, infants all the way up to six years of age, this pattern, because it will become so ingrained in them that it will become part of their life as a result. And interestingly enough, if you sacrifice your authority in those early years, you'll end up compromising your influence in the lives of your child in those later years. That's how it works. So the result of good parenting is for you and your children to be friends. This is really the goal. However, listen to me carefully, this is not where it starts. When kids are young, they must learn to submit to you and give you the right to rule as parents. And I've seen parents who try to make their relationship with their children a friendship relationship when the kids are really little. And I'm telling you, that is a big, big mistake. So remember, you can't make anybody submit. We each have a choice and we must choose to submit. But here's how this works in the lives of our kids. From birth to five, you as the parent are the disciplinarian. From, from birth to five, you are the disciplinarian. Then from six to 12, you're the trainer. These are the years when, as a parent, you are more about training than being a disciplinarian. You've already done that. You've already established that foundation. Doesn't mean that you might not still have to do it occasionally, but now it shifts over into a training application. And then from about 13 years old to 19, you are the coach, okay? And uh, from 19 and up, you become their friend. I've often said it's amazing how when I turned 21, uh, my parents became the smartest people on the planet. And uh, I see this happening all the time. You know, when kids are in there 12 and 13, they just think they know so much more than their parents and their parents are so stupid and bless their hearts, you know. <laughs> and then when they come into their, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, all of a sudden their parents become really smart. So it is an interesting process, isn't it? 
as we're raising children, uh, you know, the only manual that we have for this is the Word of God. So it really is important for us to find out always what the Word of God says, but especially in this area of learning how to develop a culture of honor in our homes. So let's look at some ways that a child can honor their parents according to the book of Proverbs. Number one, a child learns honor by listening. Proverbs 1.8 says this, My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Hear the instruction. And this is really important for kids. And this will help develop a culture of honor in their hearts. And then Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 1 says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments within you. Well, if you're going to receive the words, you're going to have to learn how to listen. Right? This is all part of that training process with our children. And then again in Proverbs chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. Wow, so good. A child learns honor by wise actions and behavior. And we find this in Proverbs 27, verse 11, which says, My son, be wise. And make my heart glad. You know, when a child has wise actions, uh, what happens is you actually cause uh, your your parent, uh, the child causes their parent to be glad. Man, what a blessing when you see your child or your children making decisions that are wise decisions. It really is a blessing, isn't it, as a parent? Uh, Number three, sharing good news with our parents can bring health to their bones. Proverbs 15 and verse 30 says, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart and a good report makes the bones healthy. Now, I don't know if you've you've thought of this from the child to the parents in this application, but it absolutely works this way as well. So sharing good news with our parents can literally help them to be healthy and to have a good attitude and to be able to strengthen that parent-child relationship. Number four, children learn honor by blessing instead of cursing. We find this in Proverbs 20 and verse 20, which says, whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out into deep darkness. The lamp here speaks of influence. So when you uh, are cursing your father and your mother, what you're doing is you're actually causing your own influence in life in this generation to be put out, to be snuffed out. It's obviously the enemy who is coming to steal, kill, and destroy in this area of one's life. And how he does it is many times by developing a bad attitude and out from the heart comes these cursings where you're actually cursing your father and your mother. So the Bible says that uh, obviously if you're going to do this, your influence is going to go into deep darkness. So don't do it. Number five, a child acting foolish brings dishonor. We find this in Proverbs 17 and verse 25. It says, a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. Number six, involvement in immoral relationships not only affects us, but it also causes our parents to grieve and even lose their energy. The whole chapter of Proverbs 5 is a great resource for this point. I started listing some verses here, but really, if you have time, just go to the whole chapter of Proverbs 5 and spend some time reading and meditating in that chapter. Man, it's incredible. When Jesus was accused of having a demon, uh, moving forward here now, in John chapter 8 and verse 49, listen to what he said. He said, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Jesus was saying that he was honoring his father by acting like him. So, you know, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees and sometimes even the multitude was accusing Jesus 
of having a demon. Jesus says, no, I, I'm just acting like my father. I'm, it's not a demon, it, it's God. So, you know, what Jesus was doing was demonstrating. He was living inside out. He was living what the Father was saying to him and showing him to do. And what a great example of how to honor your father, how to honor your mother as a result. So my question today is, who are we honoring, right? Who are we, who are we acting like in our lives? Is it important at this point? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, to say that honor and respect are not the same thing. Uh, and I, I need to say that because many people get this mixed up. Honor, here, here's how it's different. Honor is given and respect is earned, okay? You don't just automatically respect someone. Respect is something that has to be earned. Whereas honor is given. I can honor all men. And the Bible talks about this, right? And so it's really much like love and trust. Same kind of thing. Love is given, but trust is earned. So when trust is broken, it has to be rebuilt through action. It's just not automatically, I trust you. No, you have to give me something worthy to be trusted. But I am required by the word of God to love you no matter what. So again, even if your mother or your father are not worthy of respect, they are worthy of honor. If you're an older child and you've grown up in an atmosphere that was not good, and uh, you know maybe your dad's in jail or whatever scenario might be happening, you know maybe they're not worthy of respect, but they are worthy of honor. So honor is a decision, right? Just like love is a decision. And if possible, uh, it's helpful to find something to be thankful for and start there, especially in a very dysfunctional situation. Is there anything that you can find to be thankful for about that relationship and start there? Okay, so number two of these seven areas is honor for authority or position. And uh, this is delegated authority, functional authority, and positional authority. All three of these kinds of, of authority levels, if you will, whether it's delegated, whether it's functional, or whether it's positional, uh, we need to help our children understand that there is honor that's required for authority or position. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as for those who must give account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. Amen. Romans 13 and verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. And then lastly here, 1 Peter 2 in verse 17 says, Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Wow. So you know what? As parents, how we respond to authority is how our children will respond. It's important for us to model this, demonstrate this, show this to our kids. We sometimes have to remind ourselves that all authority is appointed by divine decree. So then another area of these seven relationships is honor for elders. Okay, honor for people who are older. And uh, Leviticus 19, uh, 32 says this, you shall rise before the gray headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God. I am the Lord, your God. 
So in our culture today, we have just the opposite going on in the world, to where when people get to a particular age, they're no longer relevant, they no longer, you know, matter. Well, that's not what Scripture teaches us. And we have to model this to our kids, that when people are older, we don't disregard them. We actually honor them for all of the years that they have lived life. And especially for those who are believers that are older, our kids need to see the value in aging with dignity and aging in the grace of God. Amen. Job chapter 12 and verse 12 says, Wisdom is with aged men, and with length of days comes understanding. So a real practical way to help kids uh, respect when their parents are talking to somebody is to teach them what I call the interrupt rule. I talked about this in one of our other relationship universities, but the rule is to just teach your child how to honor those who are outside of self, okay? Uh, because sometimes kids can get really self-absorbed, right? So while uh, at the same time, this interrupt rule will communicate to the parent that the child has a need. So real quickly, how this works is the child just simply puts their hand on the hip of the parent who's having conversation with somebody else, maybe another adult, maybe a peer, maybe an older adult, whatever, doesn't really matter. But the parent is busy. Okay? But the child has a need. So what does the child do? Instead of interrupting, they actually put their hand on the hip of the parent. This is what I call the interrupt rule. Now, the child knows that the parent is going to acknowledge them in just a minute. And the parent knows that the child has a need. So as soon as the parent is able to, the parent then looks to the child, especially, of course, this applies when they're really little, they, you wouldn't you know, still typically do this when they're teenagers, but when they're really little, you're teaching them how to value outside of just their own immediate need, okay? So it's just a practical thing. And then another practical thing in honoring adults is to teach kids how to use language like Mr. and Mrs. And even if you don't know their last names, if you know their first name or you introduce an adult to your child, you know, like my name is Daniel. So I would say, you know, Mr. Daniel, right? Or, you know, Mrs. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so. And all this does is just helps to teach honor to our children when they're young. Then number four is honor for peers and siblings. Um, a child, uh, if he thinks that those around him have a little value, then their own self-value will be lowered as well. So a lack of honor for peers will impact the child in a very negative way. And uh, Jesus said in Mark chapter 6, in verse 4, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives and in his own house. Wow. And isn't this true? You know, so many, not just a prophet, but this applies to so many uh, aspects of our life when it comes to our own homes versus public life. There are other passages that talk about how Jesus' own family, his brothers and his sisters, only saw him after the natural realm instead of seeing Jesus who he really was. They were just seeing him after the flesh. Then uh, number five is honor for property ownership and stewardship. And uh, property is uh, important. You know, when kids don't honor property or honor stewardship, you know, that you see people who are discarding things and, and uh, vandalizing things. It's because they have not been taught honoring property and the stewardship of that property. So Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Man, so important, again, to teach our kids this in a practical way. And, uh, you know, their own toys and their own things, as well as those of their siblings, those of their parents, you know, teaching them to respect and to honor uh, property, ownership, as well as stewardship of those things. And then number six is honor towards nature. 
And this is kind of an unusual one, but you know, God created this world for us to richly enjoy and it requires stewardship, doesn't it? As well as the enjoyment. And our children need to be taught to take care of uh, the environment, that it's not okay to throw your trash out into the environment. Children need to be taught that. And how we respect the environment around us uh, is important to model for our kids. Because when our children see this, then they're going to grow up knowing that there is a value here that um, they will they will be able to take into their own lives, but they're going to see you modeling and demonstrating that. That'll make a huge statement. And trust me, we need this in our, in our world today, don't we? As we see so much disrespect and we see so much dishonor, even for our environment, sadly. So for those of us who are believers, we need to be good stewards over every one of these areas and to help our children learn. Lastly, it's kind of an unusual one, and I'm going to just touch on this very quickly, but honor during mealtime. You know, this is an important area where uh, it needs to be demonstrated. And uh, not only just manners and things like that need to be taught to our kids, but the fact that our mealtime is a time of fellowship. It's a time of connection for us as family. It's a, it's a time when we can have a shared experience and we can have conversation. We can uh, use this to tell about what God's been doing in our lives and stories of how the Lord provided for us and how we saw breakthrough. Uh, and, and you know, share these stories from generation to generation. And often this can happen and should happen over a meal time. And so as we develop this culture of honor in our home and uh, around our meal, time, our shared uh, meal experience, it's going to, again, help our child to realize that, you know what, this is not just wolfing down some food, right? Standing someplace next to a microwave and zapping, you know. No, we're going to take the time to sit down at the table and we're going to have fellowship together, communion together. We're going to have a shared meal together where we can really enjoy one another's company. Well, again, this has to be modeled from us as parents to our children if our children are going to carry this on once they become adults and have their own families. So real quickly, a book that I would like to recommend to you in addition to the one I was mentioning earlier by Gary Smalley and John Trent is a book more uh, contemporary, more recent, written by Danny Silk uh, from Bethel. And it's called A Culture of Honor. And one of the things that Danny says is that honor is not an idea, but a practice, a practice of giving. I love that. So I like that. And I'd like to propose to you that it all begins um, by establishing a culture of honor in your home. So I hope this has been helpful for you today. It's a very practical lesson and one that you can see without uh, a culture of honor. If we've been in a culture of dishonor where we've not given any weightiness to this, but it's just been like vapor, like steam, like, you know, no big deal, uh, then we're going to see the results of that as opposed to when we are in a culture of honor. The difference is going to be absolutely huge. So I want to encourage you, take some time to develop a culture of honor in your own home and watch and enjoy the benefits as a result. Again, if you want prayer, maybe you're in a situation right now where you're like, man, I, I, my, my life is so messed up. My family is so messed up. I would love to you know, be able to have somebody pray with me. Don't do this alone. Call our prayer center and let somebody agree with you. And we're going to believe God with you for breakthrough even today in Jesus name. God bless you.